I've always wanted a Sony TCD5, which was their professional grade stereo portable cassette recorder, sold in various versions all the way from 1978 to 2005. But unfortunately these days, I can't afford one. Even broken ones are selling for up to $400. And even if I could justify spending that kind of money and fix it myself, I would never be able to use it for its intended purpose of being a portable cassette recorder because I'd be too afraid of it getting damaged. But thankfully I found what appears to be an acceptable substitute at a bargain price. The Realistic Miniset 11. It was introduced by Radio Shack on December 30th, 1981 at a price of $99.95. They said it's ready to go anywhere, records live in stereo, or doubles as a stereo player when used with headphones. Sophisticated auto level circuit captures concerts or conferences perfectly. I was lucky enough to find this one at a thrift store for $39, including this vinyl carrying case but not including the original shoulder strap, which would attach here. And you could pop open this flap here to load your cassette. And you can remove the entire carrying case if you don't want it. it has a nice silver finish. Separate left and right volume controls. So it does play in stereo through the headphone jack and in mono through the built-in speaker. But with these individual left and right volume controls, what you can do is you could turn up only the left channel and hear that through the built-in speaker and then turn up the right channel and hear that. So you can still hear the two channels independently through one speaker. So that's kind of neat. And it has stereo microphones built in. Not just one. There's two built-in microphones. There's a tape counter a recording and battery indicator. It has nice solid feeling mechanical tape transport controls including cue and review. Despite the name mini set it uses standard compact cassettes not mini cassettes and just like the original Sony Walkman it was based on an existing Monaro cassette recorder the mini set 9 which was introduced a year prior to it. On this side it has your input and output jacks DC 6 volt input center negative. There are your left and right 3.5 millimeter inputs switchable between aux or line level and microphone. And that can also be used to record from the built in microphones. And then on the front is the quarter inch headphone jack and the switch to go between normal and chrome tape. The chrome position can also be used to play metal tape, but it cannot record on metal tape. Underneath there's the compartment for four AA batteries and the information sticker saying it's the realistic compact cassette recorder mini set 11 model number 14-1011 custom manufactured in Singapore for Radio Shack a division of Tandy Corporation. And inside the battery compartment we can see the Radio Shack date code 7A2 means this one was made in July 1982 and that small hole there is the motor speed adjustment. You can stick in a small flat blade screwdriver and turn it to adjust the motor speed. Information about this cassette recorder is hard to come by but I was able to find a copy of the owner's manual but it's in three languages none of which are English but luckily I was able to piece together the information I needed. One of which is that it definitely can record on chrome tape. I know some of these portable cassette recorders they have a switch for normal and chrome but that's only for playback not for recording but this one definitely does mention recording on chrome tape. I also discovered that the battery indicator works the opposite of what you may be used to. On most other portable recorders when it's operating on battery power the battery indicator will light up solid and the way it indicates that the batteries are getting low is when it starts to dim or it goes out entirely. This one works the opposite. Normally it stays off and when it lights up that means the batteries are getting low. I also found the specifications. Wow and Flutter is 0.2% so not the greatest but pretty typical for a portable cassette recorder. Signal to noise ratio is 45 dB. The two big drawbacks of this compared to the Sony version is that it does not have any kind of Dolby noise reduction and the race head is only a permanent magnet. It's not an electromagnetic erase head. 
but it does have AC bias recording. Frequency response is not that great either, 125 to 8,000 hertz. But at least it sounds like they're being honest about it. And as typical for Radio Shack products at the time, the manual shows the complete schematic diagram. I have scanned in this manual and I'll include a link to it in the description. When I first got it, the original belts were still intact, but they had gone loose and stretched out. So initially I just replaced it with whatever belts I had on hand just to verify that it was working. And once I did, I ordered the correct belts for it, and now I'm going to install them. The three sizes of belts you'll need are SCY 6.5, which is the counter belt, SCX 7.4, which is the belt that goes from the motor to the flywheel, and SCX 7.0, which goes around various pulleys in the mechanism. After removing the bottom cover, you'll be greeted with the main circuit board. And here's that speed adjustment trimmer, which you can reach through the hole in the battery compartment, but you may have better access to it just going directly onto the circuit board here. And there's another adjustment right here, which controls the recording level. It is automatic recording level, but this adjusts the reference point for that. So if you find that the recording level of this is consistently too low or too high for your tapes, you can adjust it using this trimmer here. To go further and gain access to the belts, we'll need to remove this circuit board, which requires removing this tape holding these wires in place. That will allow you enough slack on these wires to lift up the circuit board, and then you'll have access to replace the belts. And now you can see the mechanism, which is almost entirely made of metal, including a metal flywheel. And all you need to do now is take this screw off this bracket then slide off that bracket and then you'll have easy access to replace all the belts. This one comes off first, the one that goes to the counter, then the one that goes to the motor, and then the one on the lowest level is this one that goes around the different pulleys in the mechanism. And then you can't really see it, but it goes to a smaller pulley on the underside of the flywheel. I removed the counter belt and unscrewed and set aside that bracket. So now I have access to replace the two main belts. Now I want to spray some contact cleaner into that record playback switch, but I don't want it to drip down into the mechanism, so I put a microfiber towel in the way to catch the drips. So I'm going to spray that control, move that switch back and forth a couple times, and hopefully that will take care of it. Now the tricky part when lowering this circuit board back into place will be that record playback switch. The hole in it needs to fit exactly onto this metal tab here which is connected to the record button. If you miss that you'll either have no recording or it will be permanently in recording mode. See I put it back together and now it's permanently in record mode because when I press play you can see it's picking up my voice. If I tap on the microphone you can see the LED indicating that. So if I would actually try to play a tape it would record over it so you definitely don't want to play a tape you care about when you first put this thing back together until you make sure you got that record switch properly aligned. You also have to make sure you got the volume control sliders lined up with the knobs otherwise those won't work. Now that the new belts are installed I'll give you a little sample of what it sounds like through the built-in speaker which honestly doesn't sound very good but neither does the one built into that Sony so it's about the same. Listening to the greatest little country music station this side of Texas, and we are only the greatest little country music station this side of Texas because of you, the fans who make us that. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. It's 10 minutes to 4 here on a Saturday afternoon at Sterling Country, 1070 AM, New Jersey's best station, WKMB. I'm John Kissel. Glad to be with you. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Now that the Mini Set 11 is repaired, I have the perfect tape to test it with. This is not quite period correct, it's from the late 80s or early 90s, but it's a realistic super tape. These were made for Radio Shack by Memorex, 
And this one is a high definition chrome equivalent type 2 ultra high fidelity. So I can open this up. They do give you a string to open it, but I decided to cut it open anyway. And there it is. Just take up the slack a little bit. And otherwise, should be fine. We can make our official first recording on the Mini Set 11. Okay, this is my official first test of the repaired Realistic Mini Set 11 with the new belts installed. Speaking into left channel internal microphone. Speaking into the right channel internal microphone. Now I have two external microphones plugged in. They're both Radio Shack tape recorder microphones. Speaking into the left channel microphone, speaking into the right channel microphone. Now holding them at a distance for a greater stereo effect. Now I'll move this switch to aux and plug in these adapters to give me two RCA line level inputs for the left and right channels. Here's the setup for recording. A uh, Technics direct drive turntable playing various stereo test records is connected to this Radio Shack amplifier acting as a phono preamp and I have its tape output connected to the line level inputs of the cassette recorder. So now I'll give you some direct hookup samples of how that sounds. For what is essentially a souped up dictation recorder, I don't think it did too bad of a job. The main limitation is that permanent magnet erase head, which produces noisier recordings and pretty much negates any advantage of being able to record onto chrome tape. But for playback of pre-recorded tapes, it sounds perfectly fine. However, if you're just going to be playing tapes, then why not get a cheaper, smaller, lighter, and less battery-hungry playback-only Walkman? And apparently that's the same question that the general public asked, because the Mini Set 11 was discontinued in 1984, and it seems to be a pretty rare model. But if you do happen to come across a realistic Mini Set 11 today, I think it's worth picking up. Just don't spend anywhere near Sony DC-T5 prices for one.